five, four, three, two, one. Lift off. It wasn't long before Steed gained a new sidekick as Kathy Gale was pussyfooting along the Bahama Sands. Enter Emma Peel. The first actress who was signed up for this role was the actress Elizabeth Shepherd. Here Shepherd is seen in her poppy-coloured fighting suit. The Shepherd version would wear just the one black glove and this was going to be the hand that would administer the fatal chop to her opponents. Unfortunately, things did not work out. Shepard was talented enough, but the character just wasn't right for her, and some said it was like a square peg trying to be fitted into a round hole. And she swiftly left after completing one full episode, The Town of No Return, and part of another, which was The Murder Market. Alas, nobody seems to know where these prints are, if they still exist, or whether they were junked. It is a pity, because it would have been fascinating to actually view these, to see how she actually was in the role. Back to the drawing board, and eventually, after auditioning and screen testing, the role went to Diana Rigg. This brunette beauty slipped on the quant, and then the leather, to avenge with Steed. A total of 60 actresses auditioned for the part. 28-year-old Miss Rigg was spotted in the Play for Today Strand Armchair Theatre, where she appeared in an episode called The Hot House in 1964, alongside Harry H. Corbett. The casting director at the time was taken back by her performance, and thought she would share her findings with Albert Fennell, the new producer of The Avengers, and Brian Clements, who was the new co-producer. So, Diana Rigg was sought as being a high contender for the Kathy Gale replacement. Rigg was asked along to the screen test, and was almost uh, an instant hit with the producers, and immediately a decent rapport happened between her and McNee. Diana Rigg said that initially she screen tested for the part as a bit of a giggle. Steed and Mrs. Peel echoed the Myrna Loy and William Powell combo in the Thin Man films, especially the wisecracks. Such chemistry and spark between both actors ensured that the production crew and writers were certain they had found Steed's counterpart, and the worry about the gap left by Blackman's departure was soon dissipated. Although the blueprint was set by Kathy Gale in Emancipation, if nothing else, Emma Peel differs from Kathy Gale in a few ways. Kathy used to, uh, to use judo to combat her assailants, whereas Emma now uses karate. However, the karate that Emma chooses is, is quite a balletic form of uh, defence, and unlike Blackman, who took lessons, Diana Rigg had an almost crash course in her style of self-defence, assisted by the stuntmen on the show, especially a gentleman called Ray Austin, who meticulously choreographed the fight sequences. The tower, gentlemen. The riches it holds. It is in our grasp. Nothing can stand in our way. Oh, I wouldn't say that.
Emma Peel was originally going to be called Samantha, and as scripts developed, her name was going to be shortened to Mantha. It was Marie Donaldson, a production press officer, that had a flash of inspiration. She mused on the words Man Appeal, boiled them down to Emma Peel, and finally, Emma Peel. ABC Television was still keen to set trends. Something that worked so well in the previous gal seasons was the actual fashions. And so they rendered the services of fashion designer John Bates for this. The monochrome fashions were designed exclusively for the show and eventually were sold to top-end retail outlets. Bates used simplistic but stylish black and white tones, which translated boldly to the black and white TV sets across the nation. You see, anything checked or dog tooth would have created an element of strobing. So, this clear cut clean image and clean designs of squares and targets worked very well indeed. We also had the start of the Mary Quant era, which uh, saw simplicity equal modernity. Mies van der Rohe quoted less is more and this was reflected in the a la mode of Emma Peel and echoed the uh, proponent of the simplicity of style in garment as well as some of the sets on the Avengers. The use of targets as seen in Emma Peel's beret and the short and the sleeveless were favourites of the mod culture which started in London and moved its way across to the USA. And the Avengers, there again, were a bang on with the trend of the times. The shadow of Prime Minister Harold Wilson's white heat of technology speech still cast over this period and there were, in the show, nods also to the space age as silvers and bold graphites were also used to maximum effect on set and on the body. It was all very streamlined, crisp and clear. It was televisual art imitating life. But in its infancy, as London had only just started to begin to swing, so the programme of the Avengers swung with it. The leather thing was also lessened, but not totally gone, as it was used to harmonise with stretch jersey, giving even more definition to the body and enhancing the movement in the fight sequences. To fashionably express the hidden tigress element to uh, Emma Pill's character, there was a substantial amount of fur and animal skin for some of the costumes, snake skin especially. These were placed tightly over flowing crepe de chine blousons, giving the character, underneath, a soft centre. The fur, controversial now, but then was just how it used to be was supplied by Selencourt. These were black and white furs to continue the theme laid down by the fashionistas involved in the programme. And the fur itself was mainly rabbit, which was cheaper but effective in representing something more exorbitant than it actually cost. The designs themselves were launched in August 1965 at the Cortlands Fashion Theatre in London, and shortly after this major retailers and boutiques were selling the line. Every trendy woman of the times could be Emma Peel for the day. By now, The Avengers was a total must-see. A total belle epoque in Avengerland began as arguably this was the uh, definitive in designer detectives. Also fresh starting, uh, as we mentioned before, was a new producer um, who was Julian Wintle and he replaced John Bryce. And there was also Albert Fennell overseeing the production and Brian Clemens of course became the associate producer, though Brian Clemens was still keeping an eye on the scripts. The music changed also, Dan Cliff left and composer Laurie Johnson provided what we now associate with the show, redeveloping it over the course of the series history again and again but still maintaining its power and it's instantly recognisable to not only cold TV fans, but most of the viewing public. It's a leviathan of a theme tune, and reflects the style of the show so admirably well. The soundtrack here is a total jazzy brass fanfare. It's used to full effect in the fight sequences, 
one of my favourite scenes and overall, to be honest, one of my favourite scenes ever to be on television happens in the story Death at Bargain Prices. This is where Emma uses the click of her fingers to obtain a gun before launching into a fight scene with an assailant. It is to me so stylish, so cool and works so well. This is why the Avengers works. Right. Back up. Give me the gun. Back up. Give me the gun. Wow, I needn't say any more. To me, this monochrome era of the Avengers, despite its lack of psychedelia and bold colour combination, is my personal favourite season. Not only do we have the slight grittiness, which hasn't faded out totally in the programme, we also have the capriciousness, and the balance is just right. Also noticeable is the uh, series now being put onto film, rather than it being on videotape, giving it a superb monochrome sheen, and the style on display with, well, just about everything really, is absolutely breathtaking. The writing, the direction, everything culminates into a tour de force programme. Albert Fennell was also an experienced film technician, so his understanding and guidance of the process totally shaped the program's look and added so much value. The Gale episodes were never screened in America, so it was with season 4 that the show was exported to the USA, with a marketing campaign prior to it being acquisitioned, which extolled pure quintessential British virtue. We, at the time, were a proud, proud nation, and this glory shone brightly in the show, captivating audiences not only in England, but eventually around the globe. And one can clearly see why. In Avengerland, the Britain we imagine as an idyllic chocolate box village infiltrated by stylish dastardly, did it actually exist, where everything stereotyped, positively so, existed. It was all wonderfully stiff upper lipped but liberal, a perfect juxtaposition. To introduce a series to America, a chessboard sequence, another pop art mod visual, was tagged on before the episode. So stateside, the viewer knew a bit about our crime-fighting duo and what they were all about. This essence of the show was snapshotted perfectly. <laughs> Extraordinary crimes against the people and the state have to be avenged by agents extraordinary. Two such people are John Steed, top professional, and his partner, Emma Peel, talented amateur. Otherwise known as the Avengers. The plots themselves, in terms of the fantastical, were amplified. 
The eccentricism, also synonymous with England's quirk, meant the plot lines now become way out and pure avant-garde. And they also sported some surprisingly, as this was still a spy show in the loosest of terms, effective blasts of classic sci-fi. For example, there's nods to Wyndham's Day of the Triffids, which saw man-eating plants sprawling in Surrey. Rainstorms that drown its victims in one foul deluge, and brainwashing in a Manchurian concentration camp, eventually revealed that it's based somewhere in Mayfair or Knightsbridge. Not to mention, of course, annihilation by pure thought in the superb episode Too Many Christmas Trees, with Steed as a victim. A year before the Cybermen trundled across the South Pole, we had the Cybernauts, robotic assassins created by madcap geniuses to rule the world. These were the perfect killing machines. How could Steed and Emma stop them? Flesh and blood is one thing to combat, but steel is definitely another matter altogether, but our duo still managed to save the day. In Avengerland, department stores are converted into atomic bombs. Fertilizer manages to wipe out everything organic in true Doomwatch style. And there's even a military base where time stands completely still. Or so it seems. Such plots here stray into pure out-and-out -out fantasy. Golf courses feature that transmit state secrets to satellites and there are genetically enhanced lethal tetsy flies being prepared and modified to devastate the planet. Bellico suffragettes mask as a keep fit class. Miss Purbright? Yes, Mr. Barton? I'm going through these Lloyd's returns. Do you know I can't make head or tail of them? That's my new filing system, Mr. Barton. Oh, is it? Then perhaps you'd be kind enough to come in here and explain it to me. I'm rather busy at the moment, sir. These invoices for the office equipment and the other... Never mind those. I want you in here. Now, sir? Right now. Did you hear me, Mr. Bright? Right now! And bring all the files with you! And a school of assassins disguise, conceal as a dating agency. Such people in places exist alongside syndicates where people get high on the adrenaline of nearly dying where they indulge in playing natty suicide games. Quirky, offbeat, kooky, outlandish, but eminently compulsory viewing made The Avengers a show, the hit it was, and its cult status went interstellar. The Avengers was a must-see television at the time of broadcast, as much as an Yves Saint Laurent outfit or a Sassoon haircut was a must-have. The Iron Curtain was also lampooned in the story to the crowd, featuring the character called Brodney, played by Warren Mitchell. He would return in the colour series. Like the previous season, guest stars also pop up. Some, I would imagine, were queuing up due to the popularity of the show and lending their acting talents to something which was proving to be the ultimate in trend. Some very well known to Doctor Who fans. For example, look out for Michael Goff, Frederick Jaeger, Andre Morel, Wanda Ventham, Caroline Blackiston, Gordon Jackson, Jeffrey Palmer, Roy Kinnear, Gerald Harper, Peter Bowles, Julian Glover, Liz Fraser even, Bernard Cribbins, Nigel Davenport, John Le Mercier, Dennis Quilly, Patrick Mower, Jacqueline Pierce, and dear Ron Moody, amongst many, many others, all appeared and supported the show, making what it was. Sometimes the show was like a glossary of cult television thespianism. 
This continued, as a matter of fact, right up until the end. Oh, and one must not forget, and I'm sure I'll mention this in the next episode in the uh, Color Rig series, none other than Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing guest star. Ah, television nirvana. Amongst 26 episodes that appear in the Diana Rigg monochrome season 4, the two that stand out for me that are in fact premium examples um, of this series and of the genre, in my humblest opinion, are the episodes A Touch of Brimstone, Come On Let's Face It, Diana Rigg, Patrick McNee, Peter Wingard against a backdrop of sin and debauchery, set at the Hellfire Club. What's there not to delight at? So controversial was this episode at the time, it was banned in the USA for a while, and censored in the UK for having far too many whips. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, midnight approaches, the witching hour, and as a sign of that hour, as a symbol of all that is evil, as the epitome and purveyor of this night of sins, I give you the queen of sin, Mrs. Peel. Another highlight sees Emma go it alone in a story called The House That Jack Built, inheriting a house from her uncle. However, all is not what it seems, and she ends up trapped there with Steed to the rescue. Look at those sets, they are amazing, and there again maintains the steady flavour of the programme. Finally, the monochrome series came to an end with a story called Honey for the Prince where the exotic Middle East sets the scene with its colossal honey pots, nods to Scheherazade, harems, magic carpets and Mrs. Pill doing a naughty little cavort, the dance of the six veils. And also, quite a bit of innuendo featuring in most of the episodes of this season. Now, dear viewer, can you see why this is one of my favourites? I hope you can. The majority, if not all, of the episodes of this series is excellent and highly enjoyable. I stand corrected, immensely enjoyable. To be honest, I've run out of words of praise. Predictably, and deserving so, the Avengers gained a huge following in the USA, and the stateside wanted more. The schedule for McNee and Rigg was gruelling enough though, comprising of 14 hour days, 60 pages of dialogue to learn per week, and due to it being filmed more outdoors, the gruelling schedule was a little bit hectic for the people involved, producers as well. However, contracts were renewed for another 26, and to appeal to its stateside fans, as well as having investment from the Americans, the Avengers entered the psychedelic era by adding a soak of polychromasia. In layman's terms, the Avengers was going to be showcased in bold, beautiful colour. Until next time, cheerio. Feels very strange without a body. Not like home at all. I feel a deep sense of loss. When you think of all the bodies we've had in the past. More than we needed sometimes. Didn't know when we were lucky. The bearskin rug. We haven't looked under there. Steve, you ever heard of finding a body under a bear skin? Bear skin? It is a body. A woman's body. But it's alive.
I don't mind. I'll handle this personally. Yeah. Yeah.